that uh, uh, that you're here and you joined us and uh, teach us about uh, your understanding of <clears throat> something which actually has a lot of significance, I think, for uh, for people both at Amachi Labs and the Center for Women Empowerment and Gender Equality. Um, yeah, I was reflecting on archaeology, uh, which I know practically nothing about, but uh, I was thinking that it was really too bad that I started off and what I started off in, because archaeology seems to me to be such an all-encompassing area, discipline. I'll talk about it when, uh, when I introduce you, though. Well, time. Talking about archaeology is my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> I am certain of Amazing, that. Amazingly. <laughs> yeah, a big surprise, huh? <laughs> yeah, it is a big surprise. Right. I never, I never really, I, I never believed that I, I'm, I'm going to spend my life doing archaeology and somebody is, is going to pay me for that. It still amazes me. I understand you completely. Right. So I had the same thing around psychology. Um, you know, it's my, uh, my deep passion. And it's not just uh, a narrow interest, it's a wide interest the way that yours is. And uh, it is just endlessly fascinating. Right. So if we can give them something. Yeah. Yeah, I just wrote something to somebody about uh, the life of our minds and uh, how important it is for us, of course, in scholarly and scientific work. Uh, but first and foremost, uh, I think it's the heart, and then comes the mind. I agree with you. That's the first thing I tell any of the people who want to uh, continue studying archaeology. I tell them to follow their heart because there is no money there. There's no big business. <laughs> no, no, it's, only heavy, it's, only heavy, uh, it's only having fun and enjoying what you're doing. Right. If you think you're going to make money, you got it in the wrong place. Yeah, I, I, I completely. I've been there for a long while. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. So, I've Krippa, always, you, Sydney, I've always, Krippa. I've always had enough. Archaeology was good for me. I never looked for money. I have enough. Yeah. yeah. I know what you mean, and. Um, I always have the feeling, especially when I finish something, that I've just begun. That's, that's uh, some of the magic. Mm. It's just now, I'm at the beginning now. Okay, Namaste. My name is uh, Matt and I'm going to moderate later on the question and answer session if we have. And uh, Dr. Sid, shall we shall we start officially? The okay, session? sure. Okay. 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 You know what? I, I suggest uh, for two things. First of all, one, just for a moment that people turn on their cameras so that uh, Avi will have a chance to see everybody. <laughs> yeah. We still have you. Warm welcome. <clears throat> And uh, Bhavani, nice. are you there? Nice to see you all. Uh, okay, I don't see. Uh, and there's somebody here, uh, you probably saw his, uh, his name, maybe you saw his name, Tsur Sayag, so you know where uh, Tsur is from. Yeah, I can guess. Yeah, uh, he's going to be doing his PhD at uh, Amrita University in India, where we are now. All right, very good. Yeah. Okay, so uh, friends, let me, uh, uh, actually, why don't we begin the way that we <clears throat> almost always begin. <clears throat> uh, 
Uh, Nandita, will you uh, begin with the prayer? Mm. Nandita? Om Shri Guru Pyo Nama Hari Om Yaya Madhavala Vagunthana Vadim Tejo Maim Nishtiki Snikta Panga Vilokini Bhagavati Manda Smita Shri Mukhi Vatsaya Amrita Varshini Sumaduram Sankirtana Lapinim Shamanangim Madhusikta Suktim Amrita Nandat Mikam Ishvarim Om Amrita Ishvari Namaha Om Amrita Ishvari Namaha Om Amrita Ishvari Namaha Okay, thank you. So, Avi, this is, uh, <clears throat> I'm sure every time that uh, you give lectures, they begin with prayers. Um, <laughs> no, no, not really, but it was beautiful. I know, I know. So, uh, in, uh, in Indian schools, in the corner of a, each classroom, is a picture of the goddess of learning and their candles. And every morning, children come to the corner, they light a, a candle, it's the candle of knowledge spreading light, and they say a prayer. And the prayer is a prayer of um, asking. The, uh, the goddess of, or actually projecting your own feelings onto the goddess about, uh, about what happens when you learn that there will be no oinut, uh, I don't know what the word is, forget, uh, and that there will be um, harmony uh, within the person who's saying the prayer and the people who are around there and of course with the teacher. Okay, so my friends, this is um, Avi Gofer, who I met probably about three, four years ago. Akshay from, um, you, you probably remember him, Akshay from India, from uh, the, the university and from Amachi Labs was at a conference and he and I were together for a while. And um, I asked if he wanted to see a, uh, an archeological site because he works in the area of making tools uh, as a form of teaching. <clears throat> and uh, also he does uh, michzur, what's michzur? Uh, recycling. Recycling. And Avi was very kind. I called him. He was kind. He asked us to come to his site. Uh, it was only uh, a site of only 10,000 years uh, early prior. Afterwards, I visited another one, which was about 400,000 years uh, old. And um, both Akshay and I were struck by the, uh, the splendor of, of the work. Hard work in the sun um toiling away and it has some kind of connections in a way with uh, psychology uh, as i saw it and that is is that you find pieces you find shards not most things are not complete and then what you try to do is to complete the pieces and to make a story a cover story that puts the pieces together. And this is what happens in psychology. We mostly have snippets of memory here and there. And then we try and make a story that uh, makes sense so that it's more or less coherent, not always, but tries to be somewhat coherent. I was struck by it, by the hard work and by the intellectual efforts that are involved in it and dealing with 10,000 years ago, 400,000 years ago, um, and holding something, an object, 
that a person 400,000 years ago held. And now it's in my hands and it was created an artifact created by somebody else, not for me, but for what their lives were, the practical lives were at the time. So I found it really very, uh, very inspiring. I was grateful uh, to Avi for that. And then I visited Avi and some of the students at uh, his lab at Tel Aviv University. And then I asked him recently if he'd be willing to talk with us. And he said yes. And he wanted to talk about the domestication of agriculture. Well, that's, uh, I thought, far afield from looking at stone tools that were created 400,000 years ago and possibly teaching going on at the time. But I was happy uh, for anything, knowing that uh, Avi has a lively mind and enormous uh, uh, information about different areas. So let me tell you just one quick thing and then I'll turn it over to you, Avi. Um, <clears throat> What, what must have, the questions that come to mind for me, what must have been there intellectually uh, in terms of consciousness, in terms of uh, planning a future that people decided to, uh, if it was a decision like that, to create they had to understand something about the plants and how they get domesticated, how to do it. And it took uh, possibly uh, several mil millennia for it to spread. And when it spreads, uh, it's not like planting, well, it's sort of like planting a seed somewhere, but it's an intellectual seed, a cultural seed that gets passed down. Now, only within your own band or your own uh, tribe or your own group, but now you're passing it on to other people. And this is a great drama, a great human drama, uh, what it is that Avi uh, has been looking at and will be talking to us about today. So Avi, thank you very much uh, for coming, really. Thank you, thank you, Sydney. And uh, if you don't mind, I will share my screen with you. Can you see my screen? Is it okay? Yes. All right, so uh, thank you again, Sydney, uh, for introducing me to this forum. And um, thank you, whoever it is who organizes this for the opportunity to be with you today. Um, this talk is devoted to the Neolithic Revolution. It's a term coined by Gordon Child almost a century ago. The Neolithic Revolution is a socioeconomic move from an economy based on hunting and gathering to an economy based on food production. I prefer to call it the agricultural revolution. Now plant domestication is an important component of this revolution and it has taken place independently or if you wish, convergently in a few domestication centers around the world, as you can see in this map. I will use the case of plant domestication in the Near East as an illustration. The plant species domesticated include these who you see in the list, and I can show you first the wheat, then the barley, then the lentil, then pea, chickpea, and flux that was used for the seeds and for oil. Just for your information, the Near East is the only place in the world, it's the only domestication center where animals were domesticated too, and at the same time, and this includes goat, sheep, cattle, and pig. 
In other domestication centers in the world, like in the Near East, the plants domesticated include legumes and cereals. For example, rice and soybeans in China or corn and beans in Mesoamerica. These are, this is a well-known and efficient dietary combination that you possibly all know today. Now, talking about a revolution, I, I, used, I used this phrase because it's an old album by Tracy Chapman that you can see in this small picture. I used to listen to since the late 1980s. I hope some of you know Tracy Chapman, and if not, you can just YouTube her name. It's still a wonderful album and uh, quite relevant to our topic in some ways. So let's talk about revolutions and let's talk about domestications. What is a revolution in human history? It's basically a cultural in transformation, breaking the rules, breaking the rules of the game. It's a basic change in perception and in life ways. A revolution is in need of innovative people with sharp minds, with sharp eyes, who see afar, but it needs cultures and communities that can contain and apply innovations and change, which is not an easy thing to do. So here are some examples of human revolutions. Humans became tool makers, and it is a revolution. Humans became food producers, and this is a revolution too. We had the industrial revolution some two centuries ago that introduced mass production and a continuous process of economic growth. And now we are going through the revolution of communications and our fast move to computed and virtual worlds taking place just in front of our own eyes. And this is a revolution too. And this Zoom session is, is, is a good manifestation of this revolution. Each such revolution produces and shapes new situations and new behaviors and new domestications. So what do we domesticate? What is a domestication? A domestication is a change in relations between the domesticator and the domesticated, between humans and the world, between culture and nature, the way Claude Lévi-Strauss used to call it. Domestication is a new discourse between humans and the world. Domestication is a reorganization, creating a new order, new interrelationships between humans, and in our case, plants. as a gesture to the book we published in Hebrew that you can see in this slide that, that appeared five years ago and it is to be published soon by Cambridge University Press in English. Domestication was defined by this girl, by this young girl, as a shattered communication arena, a new order taking over nature, some kind of a confrontation. This is how she viewed it. In a somewhat less politically correct way, domestication is a takeover. It's a manipulation made in, 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 in order to enlarge human benefits. We take over selected species of plants and animals. We take over energies such as heat, to be used in transforming materials irreversibly into new 
human-made materials, and more and more. So let's have a look at some of our archaeological or cultural data and see some illustrations for domestications that have been uh, 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 domestications of that people made in the past. For example, and I mentioned it, the early production of stone tools can be seen as a domestication of stone, and it took place three million years ago. The early use of fire can be seen as the domestication of fire. And this took place about half a million years ago. The domestication of plants and animals took place some 10,000 years ago as the beginning of agriculture. And we will talk about it later. We also domesticated water some 10,000 years ago, mostly for irrigation. We domesticated fire again this time as a source of energy for industries such as the lime plaster industry that you can see here on the floor of this structure and for making pottery vessels. We domesticated metals like copper and gold. And this happened some 6,000 years ago. And we domesticated space First, the rural landscapes, and then urban landscapes. And this happened around 5,500 years ago. And now we are domesticating the sea, we are domesticating the air, we are domesticating space. And while doing all this, we domesticate ourselves into the domesticated world that we are creating. We domesticated our thinking, we domesticated our mind, and we even domesticated the supernatural into an established set of beliefs and rituals, as we have just seen at the beginning of this lecture. And nowadays, as I said, we are busy domesticating the virtual, the imagined borderless spaces. And we continue domesticating the globe in an accelerating tempo that has become an ideology. As a result of the many domestications, and since we are so successful and we keep growing all the time, the world is warning us by shouting for help before it's too late. Of all these revolutions, and domestications. I focus on plant domestication some 10,500 years ago in the Near East, which is part of what I consider the most dramatic revolution in human history, an overarching change in human ideology, in human perception, and in social economy a major cultural, cultural turning point in human history. Many of the new ways of thinking and the socioeconomic institutions became part and parcel of our life here and now. Now, although they have been uh, invented, domesticated, revolutionized over 10,000 years ago. So how is all this reflected in the archeological or in the cultural record? Can we see change? I'll try to show you a brief exhibition, and if time permits, contemplate a bit on the significance of Neolithic cultural aspects in shaping our here and now. Or in other words, I will present some thoughts on the modern condition of man as reflected by the story of plant domestication in the Near East. Now, for those of you who are not, do not closely follow the archeology span at all and plant domestication research, especially and in the, in the Near East, let me just present two or three points as a short background. Now, the major protagonists 
or actors in the play of plant domestication in the Near East are archaeologists investigating culture and behavior. Archaeobotanists investigating plant remains recovered in archaeological sites. Biologists or geneticists investigating crop plant genetics. Agronomists studying, studying uh, crop adaptation and husbandry. And geobotanists studying the environment and the ecology of the relevant plants. A good script for this play would be, in my view, based on creating a trustful interrelationship between three of the major actors, that is the biology of the plants, the environment of plants and humans, and humans' culture. This interrelationship should be made so that a synergetic interplay will take place between these actors, creating a whole that is bigger than the sum of its parts. My second point of introduction is that basically there are two models reconstructing plant domestication in the Near East. And we need to decide which of the two shows higher parsimony. Now the two models are first, on the one hand is the protracted autonomous or non-centered model that emphasizes a, a millennia long process, the protracted process of domestication that was geographically autonomous. That means non-centered and C it was characterized by automatic selection that is, it was an unconscious process. In a way, if you are bold enough to say that, it is considered by this model to be a prehistoric accident of sorts. On the other hand is the alternative model, the core area one event model that views Near Eastern Neolithic plant domestication as knowledge-based, that is conscious, of course, occurring in a geographically limited core area, and lastly, a short single event. So the two models are in deep disagreement and reflect two different frameworks of thought, and especially the way one views prehistoric humans. My third point of introduction is that you may have noticed that the models as they stand present a set of dichotomies as their names indicate. And when looked at in more detail, these include amongst others, a series of paired issues like locality, did plant domestication take place in a specific and well-defined core area within the Levant? Or was, was it very localized? Or did it occur independently, autonom autonomously in different places? Or was it diffused? And had it originated in a single area, where was it? Length, was the process fast an event in terms of archeological resolution? Or was it millennia long or very protracted? The process, the domestication occur, occur in an exclusive single episode for each species and for the package of species as a whole, that is in a singular timing, or where there are multiple domestication per species and thus by definition for the package as a whole. Intent was the process incidental or circumstantial a result of evolutionary mutualism, or if you want a co-evolution, or was it a designated knowledge-based human initiative? And last is selection, where the choice of plant species and the selection of phenotypic types for domestication, conscious 
or uncon. So while it is difficult to separate the answers to these distinct yet interrelated questions, we would argue that making a decision in favor of the localized core area option, as we did, and you can see the green circle where we think it happened, taking a side on this can tip the balance concerning undecided pert topics and help in creating a coherent cultural and biological scenario of plant domestication in the Near East. This scenario accords well with the currently available data. On the other hand, opting for an alternative geographically diffused or autonomous model of independent domestication processes for each plant and in different locales within the Near East raises many difficulties and leaves many unresolved questions. So here today, I will focus on the where question. That is, is there a center of domestication within the Near East? And if so, where is this center? I will, of course, try to convince you that there is a center that we call the core area. And that it is in the northern parts of the Levant that is in southeastern Turkey and in northern Syria. Once accepting the core area answer to the where question, the aspects of consciousness and pace are solved in favor of a knowledge-based conscious and rapid, very rapid move. The cultural background of land domestication in the Near East is reflected in the archaeological landscape of the region in the relevant period, providing a glance into the immense historical processes we call the agricultural revolution. It is a telegraphic view that I will present, somewhat simplified, somewhat jumpy, and it is based on vis visible material culture elements. But since I'm an archeologist, I do believe that material culture reflects changes in culture as well as in ideology. I hope my illustration will show some transforming and changing man-world relationships from the hunter-gatherer state described years ago by an anthropologist by the name of Tim Ingold as a state of trust to the food producing state described as the state of domination. That's an old paper of the year 2000 called From Trust to Domination. So here we go. Let's first have a brief look at the major aspects that differentiate hunter gatherers from food producing farmers. This is, of course, a generalization based on, anthropolog on anthropological research. Hunters gatherers differ from food, from food producing farmers in many ways. They differ in several farmers live in larger sites and sedentary sites. They differ and social structure because hunters gatherers run a fluid system, a fluid social system open to moves between groups and egalitarian in, in essence. While farmers, they live in, in differential uh, social systems, which are not easy, uh, not, do not let easily move from one group to another. They of course differ in economy because hunters gatherers hunt and gather and basically store no food, which means they, they practice an immediate consumption of whatever they produce or collect. While farmers do produce food, they do agriculture of plants and animals. They have storage uh, installation and that means delayed consumption 
which is of major importance. There are also different demography. While hunters gatherers have a very low demography and uh, hardly grow, uh, farmers, of course, have a high demography and keep growing. And they differ in, chain, in, in worldview and perceptions or in man world relationships. While hunters gatherers have a positive way of looking at the world and they think about it as a giving environment or like a close relative, farmers have a negative, manipulative, or a confronting nature of relationships with the world. All these represent a very deep divide, a major perceptual and structural difference, and it is expressed in the low, very low ecological footprints of hunters gatherers, while footprints of food producers, that is us, keep, keep growing, maybe to a point of no return, as I said before. Let's examine a bit the human world as it looked like and behaved before and after the agricultural revolution, that is before and after the domestication of plants and animals. Now let's try to look at differences between hunters gatherers and food producers and how do these aspects look in the archeology span and in the archeological landscape. So let's have a brief look at humans footprints in the landscape from above as the eagle flies. If we take a look at present day Bushmen hunters gatherers, hunting, gathering, drinking, building huts or a camp, a full camp. This is what you see. But then if we take our first flight above the landscape some 23,000 years ago, above a hunting gathering site by the name of Ohalo in Israel and see a camp and see a, a hut that looks like this. This is what remains of it. This is how it's reconstructed. And this is how the site looks like. And you can see the stains with the different huts. Then you may notice a similar picture and the reconstruction looks like this because the site is by the Sea of Galilee. If we take another flight some 15,000 years ago, looking at the Natufian culture of Israel, of Northern Israel, we can see stone built houses this time, densely built. We can see heavy facilities within these sites. We can see many on-site burials that we could not see before. And we can see a rich array of imagery or art objects or body ornaments, including generic human representations. Now let's take another flight again, this time about 11,500 years ago. This is the very beginning of the Neolithic period. And this part is called the PPNA period or the pre-pottery Neolithic A period. We see this time in Intensive, it's like Jericho. You can see the tail in the center with deep layers, including uh, a settlement that was encircled by a wall, had a ditch out of the wall and a rounded tower that you can see here attached to the wall. 
If we take another look at this very same period in the northern part of the Levant, there is the famous site of Gebekli Tepe that is started around 11,500 years ago. This is just a minute before domestication. And we can see a, a, a really overwhelming growth and abnormal conditions for hunters gatherers. The manifestation of a change in man world relations. It is an immense site invested with stone built enclosures. This is enclosure F, but some of them have a diameter of about 20 meters. It has monumental imagery items or, or sculptures. Each of these sculptures, which we call T shaped pillars, is made of one large stone and it's really monumental. And if you can see this person down here, he's not a dwarf, he's just a normal person. These can be four to five meters high and weigh as much as four, five, six tons each. And they're each made of one stone and they show a many animal representations like these, like this, like this, like this with many signs. This growth in scale represents a climax of sorts of hunter-gatherer societies in the Near East, but it was not accompanied by a change in economy. We have no evidence from these sites for domestication of plants or animals. It makes, it, I'm sorry. It may have caused inevitable pressures, this growth, which may at least partly explain why hunter-gatherers have changed their worldviews. So let's take our last flight uh, after the PPNA, after the spirit is over, and after all the abnormalities of hunting-gathering societies that look like this. And we fly again at around 10,000 years ago, looking at the landscape of the people who domesticated plants and animals in a period that is known by the name of the PPNB, which is Prepotary Neolithic B. It's a later uh, uh, period. We can observe a real turning point and a new landscape. This is expressed in many realms of culture and in the archeological arena. We can see new site nature with large farming societies like Tel Abu Hurera. This is a reconstruction. You can see the site, a very dense site, and you can see the fields uh, outside. This is a traditional village, village life, uh, so well known to Western world images. This is how we imagine it. There is new types of architecture, not rounded this time, as it used to be for millennia, but rectangular in shape including domestic buildings, like the ones you see here from Chayono, from Turkey, it's a site in Turkey, and public buildings like the Chayono Skull House and the Nevalichui. This, this is the Skull House. There's a lot of bones inside and as many as possibly four to 500 skulls, skull remains. And uh, uh, the temples, they call them temples of Nevalichuri, which is another site in Turkey. Of course, there is a new economy. The new economy is based on domesticates. And domesticates are first found in the archeological record of this period. There are new technologies such as plaster making, lime plaster. That's the earliest pyrotechnology we know in the world. There are technologies for making flint blades, for sickle blades, and for arrowheads. There's new types of grinding stones. There are new storage facilities. There is water control and more. And there are new burial practices. 
that can be observed with new treatment of the dead. And there is also a new symbolic world, a new imagery world, this time more anthropomorphous with representations of humans rather than animals. Like this example that comes from Nevali Chori. And for me, is one of the most beautiful art pieces I ever saw. These people I'm talking about now and their predecessors in the later parts of the Neolithic period, they materialized the change, establishing fully agricultural systems that spread throughout the Near East and beyond. Although a very brief survey, it is clear that something significant was taking place in all realms of culture, settlements, architecture, economy, burial customs, symbolism, and more, just when the early Neolithic has given way to the PPNB around 10,500 years ago. By 10,000 years ago, life ways based on domesticates and farming and farming villages were fully established in most of the region that we call the Levant or the Near East. Let me just have a short run of what happens afterwards. Later in the Neolithic, further new technologies appear, accompanied by burial customs, including skull treatment, like that one from Jericho, sculpting, sculpting the, the removed skulls of, of dead people, or these from Nahal Chemar in Southern Israel, or from Tel Aswad in Syria not far away from Damascus. We have new paraphernalia for different rituals, like these stone masks that appear at that time. And new perceptions regarding social ranking, gender systems, and religion. Later on, we have pottery that appeared and a new imagery world made of stone or clay. And somewhat later, we have metallurgy that I have already showed you, and then urbanization and cities with kings and taxes, with priests and temples, with generals and armies, and so on and on and on to our modern condition. A whole series of revolutions and domestications. Now going back to our topic, plant domestication in the Near East. I would say, if we consider the relevant archeological cultural changes that I showed you briefly, and if we add the archeobotanical finds found in these sites, that is botanical remains and faunal remains, and if we add genetic analysis devoted to founder crop plants and the question of plant domestication in the region, and if we compile all these together, it will support a plant domestication in a core area that you can see on this map. It is in the Northern Levant and it has taken place around 10,500 years ago. So geobotanically, this is the only region where all the wild progenitors of the eight package species appear together. They are all there. I've been there quite a few times and you can see them by your own eye. Archeologically, the, the, the core area we suggest was a major active cultural center from which Neolithic innovations and materials spread to other parts of the Levant and beyond. This is supported by carbon 14 dates, recording the flow of, of Neolithic cultural elements from the north to the south of the Levant and to the west as well. This area has also exhibited a shift and site character, as I showed you, architecture, burial custom, economy, many material aspects 
and imagery items and symbolism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, all climaxing around 10,500 years ago with a clear, direct, and well-dated evidence of plants and animal domestication. Archaeobotanical evidence is found for all package species, all the species I showed you in the beginning in their wild form prior to domestication. That is until 10,500 years ago. Then the earliest evidence for domesticated plants and animals in this area begins around 10,500 years ago. And this is the, early, the earliest evidence we have. In terms of genetics, evidence indicates that the genetic stocks of the progenitors of several packaged species that gave rise to domesticated forms are present only in the suggested core area. This is the case for emmer wheat that was studied genetically, for anchor wheat, for chickpea, for lentil, and it was recently shown for pea and barley as well. One additional point in favor of our core area model, that is that there is a center of domestication, is the pattern of spread of domesticates and farming. As it can be seen by the archeological and archeobotanical as well as carbon 13 dates. This is very relevant to the choice between the two models I presented in the beginning. Since the core area one event model predicts the spread of domesticated plant populations from a center of domestication, that is in the southeastern Turkey and northern Syria, that can be detected by temporal spatial patterns found within the archaeological and the archaeobotanical assemblages. It can also be followed by genetic footprints of introgression that can be detected by the pattern of DNA polymorphism. That's the way the geneticists call it among the, relative, the, the, the relevant populations. The protracted autonomous model, which is the other model, is not expected to leave such spatial patterns neither among the archeological or archeobotanical data or among the DNA polymorphism data. Though for wheat and chickpea, we had a reconstruction made based on available molecular genetic data, as well as on archeobotanical ar remains. And this may be described as a ripples or a wave of advance pattern radiating out of the proposed core area, as you see on the right. These ripples are also notable in works of other researches, notwithstanding the domestication model they endorse. And indeed, the spread of domesticated plants in the Near East is in line with the spread of other cultural phenomena that we identified. Interestingly, this core area model that is fine for plants is also the case for animals, the animals I showed you before. And this is how the map looks. It is also the case for linguistics where you can see the center of the uh, origins of Indo-European languages in the same area or a bit to the west. And it is also the case for human genetics that scientists started studying in the last five years, pointing to a population with agriculture, with farming, with animals and plants that spread from this core area from Turkey to the west into Europe, as far west as Spain and Britain. And we can see the footprints of the genome of these Turkish populations that were spreading west uh, to, to the Western parts of Europe. So in conclusion, my answer was that there was a core area in the Southern Levant 
on the Middle Euphrates River, where you could, you could see it before, where farming has started. And it is quite clear, quite clearly, a rapid and conscious knowledge-based process, a human initiative with evidence for its success and fast spread within the Levant, within the Near East and beyond. So why is all this important? It is important because it structures the history of humankind. It is important because the domesticated plants and animals first spread within the Near East, then to the Mediterranean islands, and then from the Near East quite rapidly to large tracts of the globe, into Europe, into the Caucasus region, into Western Asia, reaching the Indus Valley, and into parts of North Africa. It is also important because this package became the very basis of what was later to become Western civilization. And these species domesticated some 10,000 years ago are still a significant part of our modern food economy today. And the most investigated species by modern scientists and modern science in the last century, including the biology, the agronomy and genetic genomics. We did not add much on these packages of plants and animals. So in the sense of making the choice of species to be domesticated and consumed, we still rely on our Neolithic forefathers around the world. This is no less than amazing and it has bearing on the Neolithic domesticators and on us here and now. It is also important because many of the socioeconomic structures and institutions that have been seeded, shaped and applied by our Neolithic forefathers remain within the deep structure of our culture today, here and now. And this is why I consider the Neolithic transformation as the most significant in human history. Most important, the new state of mind, the new human perceptions, the new ways of looking at the world, the new legacy of this revolution was a full divorce from the primordial structure of, hunt, of, of sharing that was practiced by hunters and gatherers. The hunters gatherers ethos of egalitarianism has vanished. This has taken us into a track of growing, a, comp a competitive world of production and growth that eventually created specialized and ranked or non-egalitarian societies with a hierarchy that is based on wealth. But mostly it is important because we became manipulative producers of food and other, other things. We became slaves of intensification and maxim maximization of benefits from anything we do. And since we are food producers for some 10,500 year, uh, years, and since we intensify food production and other industrial activities all the time, and we do it successfully, most of us believe in a very modern way of thinking that we are doomed to grow and grow and grow and enlarge the volume of our economy. A standstill or a retreat are economically and politically disastrous and will result in, re in a restless world, maybe leading to the end of modernity as we know it. Our modern condition and our manipulations cause a lot of damage that is now reaching a global recognizable scale with the heated atmosphere and a landscape full of plastic. To ease our sense of guilt, we try to compensate the world and humanity by making museums, natural reservations, or gene banks far too late to be really efficient. By now, 
we lost a lot of our uh, planet's wildlife, a lot of human cultural and linguistic diversity, and a lot of the variability that characterized traditional agriculture throughout history and throughout the world. So uh, for a, a summary sentence, or a summary, a, a last question, we got about this slide, sorry. Was plant domestication a prehistoric accident? Well, some eminent scholars, old timers of the 20th century think it was not. But many actors of the plant domestication research today in the 21st century do think it was an accident. In light of the results of this revolution, and especially plant domestication. I would not think it was an accident, but I would recommend a different view of our Neolithic forefathers, granting them no less than admiration. And I would also recommend some modesty. Modern sciences and agronomy throughout the world today are intensively engaged in improving the species that our Neolithic ancestors decided to domesticate, like wheat, barley, rice, corn, pea, lentil, chickpea, soybeans, and others. How is it that in so basic a component of our life here and now, that is our food, we are still busy applying Neolithic choices, uniquely wise choices that stand to this very day? Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you very much, um, Dr. Avi, for this wonderful presentation. It was really very exciting to follow you and uh, to uh, dive into the perspective you offered us today. Uh, it is a lot to think about and it was really very inspiring. So again, thank you and again, thank you. So now I would like to open as um, introduced in the beginning our question and answer session. So we would have 30 minutes for that. And uh, I request the colleagues, the scholars, the students to kindly raise their hands so that I can coordinate the the questions accordingly with uh, Dr. Ar. So, um, and uh, can, can I can I uh, stop the sharing? Uh, yes, if you so wish. Yes, and uh, if possible, we can turn on our video so yeah. that it is more a personal conversation between Dr. Avi and uh, us uh, for the for the question. Person. So I can see we have some activated videos, but I can't see a raised hand. So first of all, thank you for the views. And then uh, may I um, uh, call out first? Is there any feedback? So I think, Dr. Avi, we need to digest firstly what, what you have said and reflect on it. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it is really very deep and uh, I... Uh, I believe that all the, the minds and the brains of my colleagues are working highly, highly in the background. So uh, maybe I, I can start and until others pitch in. So I really liked um, the statement you made uh, more towards the end that we developed somehow or removed somehow from the attitude of sharing or the practice of sharing to competition and ranking. This uh, imprinted something really in, in my um, my. Um, mind and uh, this presentation was not just about archaeology or history, it was really also about ethics and self-reflection. And as you said, it is humbling. It is very much humbling. So who we are to think that we are the inventors or the must, must advanced society uh, which ever have lived here on earth. And uh, yeah, maybe we can uh, yeah, reflect also uh, on that perspective. So I, I invite really everyone, please participate actively, even though I, your thoughts are not something? completed yet. Yes. Can I say something in, in reaction to what you said? 
yeah. it, it just struck my mind. There, there is a study that was running with a, a, a tribe called the Nayaka tribe in Southern India, started in the 60s and it continues until this very day. It was ran by many people. Amongst them, there are some Israeli uh, anthropologists. Some of them were my colleagues, some of them were my students. They published, they published a paper a few years ago, four or five years ago, that tried to describe in scientific terms what happened to this hunting gathering tribe when the government imposed on them to stop hunting because it was not allowed in the reservation area they lived in. They had to move from being hunters gatherers to being food producers with gardens and domesticated animals within a lifetime of a person, within 20, 30, 40 years. Now they followed their thoughts and they published this paper saying that they used to think about nature in a way that they called in scientific terms, a relational epistemology. That is, they had relations with anything on the globe with trees, with animals, with water, with stone, with everything. And they were all sharing the same basic system. But within two, three decades, they objectified animals and plants because they couldn't stand the way they are, they themselves are behaving with animals and plants growing them and moving them and tying them in and encircling them with, with fences, et cetera, et cetera. So th this was a very special case to see how hunting gathering becomes farming within a very, very fast, although it was imposed. I mean, they didn't choose to make it, but they kept their way of thinking and the ethos of, of, of being equal for a long while, and some of it is still there in their minds, in their rituals, in their uh, ceremonies, in their thinking. But once the, 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 the young children started going to school, to public schools in the region, then the whole thing is, is, is retreating fast and vanishing. So th this is a really good example of how these things happened, but 10 or 11,000 years ago. So exciting. We can speak yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Maybe you can also share this paper or the, the work that you have just uh, mentioned uh, yes. with our group so that we can read on I, it. That's really I can, beautiful. I can send it to Sydney and Sydney can send it to you if, if there is a list of, of emails. If you can send me the list of emails, I will send it to everyone. Surely, surely. That would be really wonderful to see how we felt uh, one with, with nature or our environment and uh, during the time, yeah. even superior, even then, that's as a result of uh, processes. Yeah, beautiful. So, Dr. Avi, I see already movement in the um, plenum. I'm really very happy for that. So, I would like to start with Abhijit. I'm just uh, calling out the, the first uh, wins, <laughs> the first spot. So, um, Abhijit, would you kindly share your thoughts, please? Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for your wonderful talk, sir. So, sir, uh, my question is that I remember reading somewhere that women were considered as the first agriculturalist. They said this was because women had to stay back with the babies, look after the children. So they were the first to actually start planting something. And this is, they are called as the founders of modern day agriculture and which led to the starting of settled societies. Uh, so I'm not sure if I've read this correctly. Uh, do you think that that makes sense or it's just fiction, which is, <laughs> because I've read it somewhere. So I thought I'll just confirm. I, I wouldn't say it's fiction. I'm, I'm not, I don't <laughs> want to be judgmental, but, but basically if you want to make a change like this, you, it starts with the mind. It starts with your consciousness. It starts with your perceptions of the world. A hunter-gatherer cannot settle down or domesticate a plant or an animal unless he gives up his basic ethos, his basic perception of the world. Because you cannot dominate 
You cannot dominate, you cannot consume and store, you cannot, you, you cannot objectify these, these things. It's impossible as long as you hold the ideology of a hunter-gatherer. Hunter now, why did they settle down and why did they have more babies than they used to? Or why did they, their demography grow? That's a different question. But you should know that at least for the Near East, settled or sedentary settlements that sit year round for many years started thousands of years before agriculture, before we have evidence for plant domestication and animal domestication. So people have settled down for other reasons. And maybe this was the trigger that was the start of a process that led, finally led to, to domestication. But it, it, it's not about not moving because of too many children. It's always the, you know, it's the question of a chicken, the chicken and the egg. What was their first? Was there settling down and then a growth that, that forced people to do A, B, C, or D? Or was there a growth? And this is why they had to settle down. So these, these chicken and egg questions are, are never solved. But we have evidence in the Near East, at least. It's clear that they settled down much before they started uh, farming. Yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Avi. And thank you, Abhijit, one of our PhD students, by the way. So next would be um, Dr. Zofia, one of our uh, colleagues. Dr. Zofia, please share your thoughts. Yes, hello. Um, thank you, Dr. Avi Gofer, for, all, for your wonderful presentation. I think this topic is really fascinating. And I've actually, I mean, I don't know much about it, but I'm just fascinated. And I've read that it was I mean, of course, we're grateful now that we that the agricultural revolution took place. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here and have all this, this modern comfort and everything. But at that time, they actually um, made their life much more difficult. I mean, I read that the hunter-gatherer, they hunted for one, two days, and then they rested a couple of days. Again, they went out. So they had much more leisure time. And, and when they started agriculture, they had to work really hard every day. They had more diseases. They had less nutrition. They had um, then they had ownership. Then they then they had all this, this. They had wars. They were raiding each other's grains, and all these things happened. So in a way, in a way, it made their life more difficult. But they could never go back. Like it took on its life. The, the revolution took like had maintained. I mean, they had all these mouths to feed. They had more children. They could never go back to their hunter gatherer lifestyle. And it just went on and on. Like they could never go back. And, and it's the same with, I think, with our digital revolution. Like, we don't actually need the mobile phone for our survival. But once we have them, once we have all this technology, we, we, we can't go back, really. So I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, well, <laughs> that's a big question. Um, well, there, there is, there is a, this, this legend about the beautiful life of hunters, gatherers, working two days a week, and chatting and gossiping the rest of the week and having fun. But this, this was uh, written, written in a paper in 1968, uh, and it was called the, the, the Real the Affluent Society. And you know, these anthropologists uh, walking and measuring the steps and the energies invested in walking and in hunting and et cetera, et cetera. But life is not so simple, and these ideas have changed dramatically in the, in the five or six last decades. Life of hunters gatherers is not that easy. It depends on the environment in many ways. Uh, we, we cannot look at real hunters gatherers today because the world is, is being conquered by farmers and by states and, and borders and soldiers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the, the, this life has its own has its own structure it's not a matter of it's easier or or harder to live this way on the other hand we we have the biblical uh, idea of becoming farmers it, it means that you've been uh, sent out of of paradise if you remember the, the the biblical statement it says that as a punishment for uh, even adam they were uh, uh, sent out of, uh, of, of paradise and, and 
they were told by God that from now on, they will have to work for their food, be farmers, sweat the land, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are images in, in Western civilization that, that we keep in mind all the time, and it's very difficult to get rid of them. But I'll give you an example from uh, direct uh, scientific uh, uh, story that happened in the last few years. It was said in many papers that domestication of plants was what they call a labor trap. It's a trap that makes people work a lot more, the way you said. Now, they, they, they explained it by saying that taking the grains out of the domesticated uh, uh, cereals would be much more laborious, would take a lot more work and energy than it is to take these grains out from wild cereals. That's a nice statement. It sounds quite logical because we have in mind these old conceptions that we never got rid of. But we, we are stubborn. We have a group of people, uh, you know, agronomists, biologists, botanists, archeologists. We said, okay, it's a good argument. Let's have an experiment with good controls and do it and we can measure what it takes. So we did for three years, we collected 70 different lines of cereals and we did the, the, the whole process to the, to, to the situation where you have flour that you can use for your bread or pita bread. And the result was very clear. There was a difference of six times between the work needed for domesticated or wild, but it was in favor of the domesticate, of the, of the wild, which means the wild needed much more work than the domesticated and not vice versa. So there is a lot of statements that are based on our way of thinking, on our ideologies, on our general cultural perceptions, being Westerners or being uh, from other parts of the world. Everything has to be checked. We don't believe anything. If you make a statement, you have to do the experiment, you have to control it, and you have to do it uh, very, very carefully, and then show us the facts. And for example, concerning what you mentioned about working hard, the case is just the opposite in case of, in, in case of the cereals. Yeah, thank you, thank you. That explains it. This, this is also a paper that we wrote a few years ago and I can send it to everyone if you're interested to read it. We are interested. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zafia. Thank you, uh, Dr. Avi, also. You, uh, this session is not a, just about your uh, expertise, but also about the ideal attitude of a scientist. And uh, yeah, that's really beautiful to listen to your Well, advice. I can tell you, I can tell you that being stubborn and not believing anybody unless you experiment things doesn't, doesn't make your life very happy. <laughs> I can tell you that. You're in many cases a minority. You go on a conference, there's 200 people, and then somebody on the, on the stage says, ah, well, we reached consensus concerning plant domestication in the Near East. And you sit there and you say, well, where's the consensus? I think the other way around. But and that's the way it goes. It's not easy to be a minority, but I used to be a minority. And uh, I say it's because of scientific conduct. My wife says it's my bad character. But <laughs> I'm an, I'll, let you, I'll let you judge. <laughs> I, I'm a minority with the attitude of a world citizen, maybe also that is uh, maybe larger than that at the end. All right, so uh, let us continue with the next statement. It's um, a uh, PhD student and he really would like, he has, he has a bad connectivity and he asked kindly if I could read out his question. So his name is Krishnail and he says, Dr. Avi, what responsibility does a country like India have for preserving pers pers biodiversity and agricultural practices for future reference? Question mark. India has shown leadership and advocating for access to vaccines for poorer countries. What are actionable things that might be undertaken in India to preserve agricultural biodiversity? Thank you. 
Well, this is one of the points I, I, I didn't uh, I didn't mention in the talk, but I, I thought it can, it can be understood easily by everyone. We lost biodiversity of land races that were developed by farmers for the last 10,000 years all over the world. There were thousands and thousands of land races of cereals, of legumes, of uh, vegetables. Of, they are all gone because they are very large and very strong uh, grain companies. You know, I'm not going to mention names that take over the whole world and they make you use their, their seeds. They make you use their sometimes uh, uh, engineered uh, seeds. And we are losing all these diversity. Now, why is it important? I'll say two points. One, in 1909, that's 112 years ago, there was an Israeli guy that wrote a paper in the most important journal of agriculture in the United States. His name was Aaron Aronson. And he was the guy that found the mother of wheat in some very rocky and, and very uh, difficult terrain for, for these plants to grow. And in this paper he wrote, Nobody knew anything about genomics. Nobody knew anything about genetics. But he said that if we manage to pick out of this, these plants, the mother of wheat, if we manage to pick out some of the traits that make these plants so resistant and successful in such bad conditions, we can improve agriculture all over the world, okay? So now as for the question in India, India possibly had thousands and thousands of thousands of land races developed in different parts of India and different environments by different people and different methods, uh, different ways of looking, different goals to achieve by doing these changes. Now all these whole genes that can do marvelous things in modern, in, in modern agriculture. They can change plants, they can enlarge resistivity, they can lower the, the, the need for water, etc., etc., because each of these was adopted by the farmers along hundreds and thousands of years to be able to supply a, a living, to provide a living for these people. Now, once we get rid of these, it happens very, very fast. If you stop growing something for a year or two or three or five, unless there is a, someone really uh, aware of the, of the story that would pick up some, some, uh, some seeds and try to, to keep them. We are losing all this experience, all these settings that become part of the genetics of these plants, part of the, uh, of the process of, of adapting them to, to the environment, to the climate, to, to, to the needs of the people. So I hope, I think, there are still uh, in, uh, enough places in India that, that some of this is, is kept and it should be, and it should be taken care of. And we should in our region take care of the, the wild progenitors of these plants because the wild progenitor has more traits and genes that can be very helpful for us in the future. Not now in the future, it's, we, we thought we know everything 50 years ago, but we, did know, we didn't know anything. And we think we know everything now, but we don't. So once, once we give up these things and we lose them, it's a loss that I don't, I don't know if, if we can ever, if we can ever um, uh, do something about. Because if you make a gene bank in, in Norway under the snow, it's very nice. But then you go all over the world looking for a land race something, you know, something original, what we call in Israel and following the Arabic word, something baladi. But, but this, this is gone. By the time we are looking for it and we spent a lot of time making a, a, a gene bank, most of these things are gone. It's the same here in the Near East. It's the same all over the world. 
Thank you very it's much, Vanessa. So we would have six, six more, more minutes to end today's session. I would like to invite also Dr. Sitz to share his uh, uh, thoughts, final thoughts for that session, close it up as usual. Uh, Dr. Sitz, I'm handing over to you. So Avi, um, what a wonderful, um, stirring talk, really. Uh, it was uh, a tour de force uh, showing wide swaths of knowledge converging on the ideas that you were presenting. Uh, it, it was a simply wonderful. Two, two things, one is just a comment for uh, all the people in the center and Amache Labs. And the second is a question. So the one about uh, the comment, I think it's critical that working in the villages, working with women in the villages, bringing about changes in women's perceptions of themselves and their roles in the families, et cetera, that this has to be done with the utmost sensitivity. And it's quite possible that by bringing about changes for gender equality, as much as can be done, that it won't just be gender equality. It'll go way beyond that. And so you have to be sensitive, I think, to uh, what these changes are that we're bringing about by bringing ideas to the villages, ideas that are not inherent in the, in the villages now. That's not to say, don't do it. It's to say, be humble, be sensitive, and try and see beyond the specifics of gender equality and to see what happens to the society of the, of the, uh, uh, of the villages, the tribal villages. So that's just a comment. <clears throat> and because I am a, uh, for my question, I'm sort of single-minded in a way. And I see teaching everywhere just like what you were doing right now uh, in your talk. But above and beyond that, when these uh, uh, domestication of plants or animals spread, it means that the ideas were being moved from one person to another, from one group to another group. But groups don't transfer information, individuals do to other individuals. And then it might catch on, whatever that means, and it spreads within the area where people have heard about and seen what is being done. <clears throat> so, and I know that teaching is not like skulls where you can see skulls from, from years ago. The moment you teach something is there, but it's invisible. And I was wondering, uh, uh, despite that, if you have any speculations about teaching as uh, a form of passing on the information uh, that leads to the spread of the ideas uh, from one person to another and over maybe a thousand years uh, and maybe thousands of kilometers. Well, uh, first, ju just just a comment on what you said at the beginning. Uh, studies of of gender systems in the Neolithic uh, period are 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 just starting. Uh, there are notes and comments here and there, but I I had a study. Uh, it was a very long uh, field and and lab study concerning the the change in women's uh, gender. Uh, um, the place of women in the gender system uh, sometime in the middle of the Neolithic period. 
and I think I can I can I can indicate or I can point out where where this uh, change that brought us to where we need to make a change again has <laughs> started. So where where women have been have have become some kind of, of assets for, for for the society. I think we can we that's a different talk, but I think there is a lot of information about that in Neolithic sites. As for um, um, knowledge, uh, knowledge uh, transformation, um, firstly, in the world I was talking about, there is a movement of materials that we can identify exactly from where that go as far as eight to 1000 kilometers already in the Natufian before the Neolithic. So there are contacts between the people. There is what they used to call an interaction sphere. It runs from the Tigris and the Euphrates down to Sinai, which is over a thousand kilometers. Some of the things move physically. Somebody is moving them like obsidian, like cinnabar, like other materials, maybe seeds too. But some of the things that move are ideas. You don't see the material. You don't see uh, 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 items coming from a, a different part of the region, but you see a technology that appears hundreds of kilometers through hundreds of kilometers down from the north to the south or from the south to the north. And it's clear that somebody was teaching these people how to do that because it's a, a technology that was non-existent before. Now there's studies in the last few years showing that there were what they call itinerant uh, 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 specialists, people that were moving from one village or from one farm to another, teaching other people how to nap specific types of blades or tools or how to, uh, to do all kinds of other things. So th there is a system working. Now, how is it happening uh, in reality? I think the contact zone, because between many of the groups, is a zone of a lot of interaction. And within this zone and the meetings and, and the, the, you know, the, the places they aggregate to meet seasonally or yearly, uh, this is where the information is moving, moving from one to another. This is where other things are moving too, including materials, genes, et cetera, et cetera. But, there, there must have been a, a, a mechanism of people meeting uh, and, and transforming information. But in the communities themselves, there is a process of learning. There are, according to the ethnography, there is two, three different ways of, 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 transfer, uh, uh, of, of uh, uh, teaching. It, it could be active, it could be passive by, by uh, you know, by imitation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But it's clear that because we have sites where you can see that there is a, an area within the site, within the structure, or by the fireplace, that was uh, assigned to teaching, and you can see the products of the students that are much less uh, sophisticated and successful than those of the, the other people that make the regular tools. So there is, there is a system working for, for knowledge transmission within communities and, and between communities. But I think the between communities thing is, is, is basically the heart of how all this has shaped up. Because you, you can imagine people isolated, etc. And this is why the, the, the model I, I, I was not accepting says, ah, well, there was a domestication of this plant here and this plant there and this plant here, and nobody knew about the others. That cannot be the case because the archeological data does not agree. It, it shows a lot of contact and a lot of uh, um, uh, knowledge transmission and a lot of sharing in terms of ideas, in terms of technologies, in terms of materials possibly exchanges of, of, of many different kinds. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to ask something, and I apologize for doing more. The itinerants, the ones you spoke about, moving from place to place. Yes. Uh, 
I'd, first, I'd be very interested in reading about that. And here's a comment to, uh, yeah. to Tsur, and that is, it's possible that these people were designated to do that. They designated cases of people who passed on information um, uh, because they were uh, possibly especially gifted in that. I don't know, of course, but it's something to think about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, for for uh, I can I can send you a paper on a case that that relates to uh, obsidian napping uh, in 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 a site in Syria, and and you can see that there is a specific place in the site or two places where somebody was sitting with these people that were napping totally different different materials, different technologies, and uh, either doing by himself or I guess people sitting around him and trying to learn what he's doing or teaching them actively. Because later on, you, you can see this technology throughout the region. So people have learned how to do it on their own and it's not limited to one place or two places in the site, but it's everywhere. So there must have been some kind of a, a meeting between somebody who teaches and, and students who learn. How exactly has this been done? It's um, if you're lucky in archaeology, you can you can have a context that can show you how it's been done. But as far as I know, the literature of the Near East uh, for now, I don't know a case like this. But you, you've been in contact with uh, one of my students concerning knowledge transmission four hundred thousand years ago. It can be seen in the in the actual finds, in the lithic finds, in the flint tools that these people were making and teaching others to make. Yeah, that's uh, Ella. Yes, that's Ella. Right. She's already a doctor, her PhD was approved, and everything is okay. Yeah. She's now so, a grown up and she has to look for a job. Mm. <laughs> right. So then, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sip. Would you like to, to add uh, something to, to that or uh, some final words before we close the session today? Uh, so, Avi, um, yeah. thank you very, very, very much. Uh, thank you. What a, yeah, it was just simply, uh, as I said, a tour de force. And for, <clears throat> I would say, probably everybody, uh, in the group, um, there isn't an awful lot of knowledge about archaeology and genetics and you know all the different areas, linguistics, all the areas that you spoke about. But you made it accessible uh, with a a, uh, uh, a very focused uh, and a focused uh, talk with uh, examples talking about what scientists know. And in that sense and other senses as well, uh, you know, the, the, even though you're talking to Zooms, right? Yeah. Um, you were a, uh, an exemplary teacher, really. <laughs> well, I, I hope so because I've been teaching for 40 years now. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. thank you very much for, for having me and uh, giving me the opportunity to talk to you. And uh, I, I really looked a bit around uh, your sites, your, your uh, internet sites, and it's, it's, uh, it's quite uh, impressive what you're doing there. And we'll talk thank about you. gender thank systems in the next time. <laughs> okay. Thank All you right. very, very, very much. Thank you. And thank you very much. Okay. And goodbye Thank to everybody. You. Uh, I look I forward up. to the end of discussions. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. I close Thank up you. the prayer. Um, Thank you. We started. And the prayer uh, is an identification of all beings and the inner wish, uh, inherent wish of may all beings be happy, free of uh, suffering, and uh, in peace. And after that, um, 
I will close up. So see you soon. It was a pleasure to have you, Dr. Ar. Well then, see you. Thank you, Nalita. Thank you, Dr. Ami. I think he's on the left. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, uh, Sid, I think we were supposed to meet right after this to discuss uh, uh, the name okay. of the app. So can we do that really quickly? And uh, maybe, sure. Nan uh, maybe Nandita, uh, you can stay on. And if you can send the link to this of this Zoom link, if you can send it. To, I don't know if you were yeah. the host, added. Kripa, if you were the host, can you transfer the host to Nandita? And, uh, and Nandita, if you can call Ajay into the conversation.